My first question is that in one of your writings, you say that skillful diplomacy and statecraft, as well as sensitivity about China, it are one of some of the factors that can prevent a war between uh, China and the U.S. in the future. I recently had the pleasure of listening to Dr. Henry Kissinger. Uh, I know you have interviewed him. I know he has endorsed your book. He gave it a presentation about a year ago, uh, right around the time that uh, uh, Trump was uh, elected but wasn't in the office. They asked him, if you are given an opportunity to sit and talk with President Trump, what would you tell him to do? What strategy would you propose? And his answer shocked me. This is Dr. Henry Kissinger in his 90s. He said, I would tell him, forget about all kinds of strategies that your advisors are going to tell you. You need to learn about Chinese culture. So if I have to ask you, what is it that this audience, this country needs to know about Chinese culture in the context of the two points you have made, sensitivity about China and skillful diplomacy and statecraft that can prevent the war? OK, extremely good question. Uh, first, let me uh, back up and uh, 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 say a word about uh, the question, and then I will try to answer the question. Uh, Henry Kissinger was my professor when I was a graduate student now five decades ago. I was his, his course assistant when uh, uh, he, to his amazement, went down to the Pierre Hotel and Richard Nixon, who he had run against supporting Nelson Rockefeller in the campaign, asked him to become national security advisor. And, uh, Indeed, he uh, tried to get me to go to Washington with him in 69, but I was just a, had become an assistant professor and was trying to grow up to be a professor, but I served as a consultant to him. And Henry continues to, he turned 94 this year, in April, he continues to think I'm his course assistant. <laughs> and so whenever he has some assignment, he calls up and he says, Graham, you know, I need you to get this material for me. And I, I say, hey, Henry, I'm no longer your course assistant. He says, you haven't graduated yet. So, <laughs> and I'm, I'm honored uh, uh, to do so. Uh, he gave a brilliant speech on, uh, on Adenhauer, on uh, recognizing the anniversary of Adenhauer back uh, last month, where I had given him this material, and then he made it into something magical. So his, his mind remains lucid as, as possible. I mean, and I'd say Henry's one of the great strategic thinkers that America has ever had the, the benefit of. So Henry uh, understands China in a way that Americans find it hard to do because uh, even though Henry is a very uh, American American, he's actually a German-born American. So he can see us through eyes a little bit more independently than Americans can often see ourselves. And he learned about China uh, not because he knew anything about China. Uh, actually, he was this, uh, he knows about Europe and European history. He, that's what he had written about. So early in the administration with Nixon, Nixon said, I'm going to do a major initiative towards China. And as Kissinger tells about in his own book on China, he thought, oh my goodness, I don't know anything about China. And he went up, up back to Harvard for a weekend to see John Fairbank, who was the dean of China studies said, how about give me a weekend tutorial, you know, to get me up to speed on it and tried to read about it. So he's read and thought and listened. So he insists, just as you say, that China is a different civilization. And the Chinese say, they're a different civilization. They're not just like us. They don't want to be just like us. They're not going to be just like us. So Americans believe ordinary Americans, most of us, if we scratch ourselves and tell the truth, really everybody wants to be Americans. They're trying to become Americans. It's just give them a chance, and everybody would like to be like Americans. Let me look. They would like to be free the way are, we are. They would like to have a society the way we do. If we just give them a chance, that's what they're yearning to be. 
And actually, even in our founding documents, we say all human beings are endowed by this same creator with unalienable rights. That these are what everybody wants. Everybody wants freedom. Everybody wants life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everybody wants to have a democratic government. The Chinese don't agree with this. That's very hard for Americans. It's kind of civilizational difference. So we saw demonstrated very dramatically last week, for those of you who watched the party congress or pieces of it, out of Beijing. So a big event happened last week and the week before was split over the weekend in Beijing. They basically crowned or they had a coronation of a new emperor. That's the way I wrote about it in a piece in the Wall Street Journal. This wasn't just re-electing a guy who's the president for another five years. They said, you are our great leader. And they even broke tradition, big tradition, important tradition, by very ostensibly having no successor. So in their system, uh, in, the, in the communist version of their system, They've been having a collective leadership because they're afraid of Mao, who became mad and who actually was so crazy that he had a cultural revolution and took Xi Jinping's dad, who was a princeling, and humiliated him and threw him in prison and took Xi Jinping when he's a little 11 year old kid and sent him out to the countryside with his sister. And his sister was so desperate she committed suicide. And he thought about that. Then he determined, no, I'm going to become, as he said, redder than red, scratched his way back to the top of the pyramid. In any case, they'd had collective leadership. Xi Jinping has transformed that. So he's back to imperial leadership in the Chinese tradition. And in that tradition, they believe, one, China, as Henry says, the, the Americans and Chinese are exactly alike, at least in one respect. We each believe we're superior. Okay? Except, he says, fortunately only one of us has a missionary culture. That's the Americans. So we try to convert other people to be free, democratic, human rights, and otherwise. The Chinese don't think anybody else is good enough to become Chinese. So they're so superior, you can become like Chinese, you can try to mimic Chinese, but you cannot become Chinese. So Americans, everybody can become Americans. They come to America, they learn English, they play by the rules, they can become citizens. You can't become a citizen of China. No, they only 1,000 people <laughs> became Chinese citizens last year. 1.4 billion people. So in their system, first, we're superior. Secondly, China in the language of, the, of Mandarin means center of the universe. It's the middle kingdom. It's the thing between heaven and the other guys. So we are it. We're the sun. Everything rotates around us. And they believe that for 5,000 years, we ruled the world. That, that the world is everything we could see. And then there was this interruption. Came the Europeans, the foreigners, with technology, and they humiliated us. So this became the centuries of humiliation. But we have now reemerged to be strong. And then we're going to stand tall. And we're going to return to the world the way that it ought to be, that it used to be, us, the center of our universe. And in the first instance, we want that in our space. And our space means in our neighborhood, our borders and the adjacent waters. So the line that Xi Jinping used in, the, in this uh, work plan, he said, China is going to st stand tall and be strong in the east. So the Thucydidean story then, which Henry likes a lot, and which I think he, Kissinger says, is the best single lens for understanding, looking through the news and noise of the day to see the underlying dynamic in this relationship, is a China that's rising to back to where it thinks it always was and deserves to be against a US that is the ruling power and has been in the Asian community ever since World War II where we think we've created an Asian order, both a security order and an economic order and a political order, that's been the enabler of all the Asian miracles. And I would say myself, I think that's true. 
that we created an environment, an international order in Asia, that nobody's benefited more from from China, but a, from a Chinese perspective, we've reemerged to our natural state now. So thank you very much for then, but now is now. So that's where the rub is, is coming. And I think as Lee Kuan Yew uh, said very clearly, and I described in the book, China is absolutely serious. Xi Jinping is absolutely serious about displacing the U.S. as the predominant power in Asia in the foreseeable future. Because he thinks that's the natural state of affairs. Yeah.